Well, good morning. I'm very excited to be with you guys, and uh, I was very excited when Tim told me that you guys were studying through How Should We Then Live with uh, Schaefer's videos. So um, Schaefer has always been um, my major hero in the faith. So when it comes to ministry and it comes to just looking you know, out and, and who is doing ministry and how they're doing it, he's always been my uh, hero in the faith for several reasons which I'll explain in this talk. So I was very excited to find out that you guys were studying through one of his books um, and very excited to come and tell you about my experience with uh, Schaefer and his ministry. So what I'm going to start out doing is just sharing a little bit of biographical information about Francis and Edith Schaefer. And I understand you've heard a little bit of this already and maybe you've watched a video, but I'm hoping I can add some things to the story that might be helpful uh, and interesting, both to how they did their ministry and how their ministry began, maybe even the roots of it. So just some basic biographical information to begin with. As Tim said, um, I'm Adam Johnson. I mostly work um, down on the campus right now with a ministry called Ratio Christi. But just recently, I've also started my own ministry with a website and a YouTube channel and other ways, um, writings that I do, podcast, to try to get um, the resources that I'm creating out to people so I can serve and help them. And that ministry we created is called Convincing Proof. It comes from Acts 1-3, the verse uh, in the Bible, Acts 1-3, where Jesus presented many convincing proofs of his resurrection. And so that's what I focus on in my ministry of Convincing Proof, is trying to provide good reasons and evidence to believe that Christianity is true. So with Francis Schaeffer, let me just give you some basic background information. He was born in 1912, so over 100 years ago, in Pennsylvania. As you know, he was a Presbyterian pastor, missionary, and author. Now what you might not know is how, uh, I guess, influential he has been in the Christian world. Uh, I'm, I'm so glad that Tim is having you guys study his work because a lot of younger people are unaware of Schaefer and Labrie. In fact, there's kind of a cutoff. I used to say the cutoff was around 45, but now I have to probably say the cutoff is usually around 50. So I, if I talk to somebody who's 50 and older, they will know of, of Schaefer. But then I find oftentimes if they're younger than 50, they had never heard of him before. So I'm glad you guys are being introduced to Schaefer because I think he has a lot of, of good things to still uh, teach us even today. In fact, a lot of people would say that or put Schaefer up with um, C.S. Lewis and Billy Graham in terms of just their influence especially in evangelical Christianity in the 20th century. So C.S. Lewis, Billy Graham, and Francis Schaeffer. Now I would say if you want to know more uh, and study more about Schaeffer and his life, this would be the best uh, biography you could read. There's a lot of biographies out there about Schaeffer, but I think this is the best one. It's written by a professional biographer, Colin Duriez, I believe it's pronounced. Yep, Francis Schaeffer by Colin Duriez. Okay, so a little bit more background. So he got married to Edith Schaeffer in 1935. And together they created a ministry in Switzerland called uh, Labri. It means shelter in French. And they're known mostly for their intellectual, philosophical uh, ministry. They focused on more of the academic, intellectual side of things as you're studying philosophical issues. But that's what, even though that's what they're most known for, what they actually created there at Labrie was a beautiful, uh, beautiful combination of loving, relational ministry combined with teaching and defending God's truth. Let me say that again, because oftentimes we err too much one way or the other. So what they were able to do, and this is what I think is very unique in Christian ministry, 
they were able to combine a loving relational community with defending and teaching God's truth. Because sometimes we can focus so much on the, the loving relationship and just being kind and being nice and, and loving, but we never get to the hard issues or confront people about their sin, right? Or we can err too much the other way where it's just we're, we're jamming truth down people's throat in sometimes an unloving way. And yeah, we're proclaiming truth, but it's done in such a forceful, aggressive manner that it comes across very ugly. And we want to avoid both of those extremes, and it's difficult. It's difficult for me, because um, we usually fall towards one end or the other. But what, what they did so well is they brought both sides of those ministries together. So they created this beautiful, loving, relational community through which they taught and defended God's truth. Now let me give you some additional background in terms of his seminary training. So Francis started at Westminster Theological Seminary in the mid-30s. So we're talking Depression era, right? 1930s, 1935. He started at Westminster. Now, it's important to understand the background of where Westminster came from, because this is going to help inform us as to how later in life he went through a crisis of faith. And out of that crisis of faith was born Labrie. So a lot of these points might, not seem, uh, might seem difficult to see how they connect, but trust me, if you follow it, you'll see how these dots get connected. You might be familiar with the battle for the Bible that took place at Princeton, right? Princeton is one of our, our most famous universities in America. And in the 1920s, there was a large fight uh, at Princeton over the Bible. Princeton began as um, really uh, an institution to train pastors. And so as a long, rich history of teaching God's word and uh, training up pastors and missionaries, but in the early 20th century, uh, and this was taking place in a lot of different denominations, but especially with this uh, Presbyterian denomination at Princeton, there were some who were moving away from, oh, let's just say a conservative understanding of the Bible. They were moving towards a more liberal understanding of the Bible, that maybe the Bible wasn't inerrant, Maybe the Bible, maybe not all of the Bible was from God. And so there was a move away, and this happens a lot, churches, denominations. But this was happening at Princeton, and so there was this huge battle then over the university, over Princeton. Who was going to be in control, if you will, of Princeton? Was it going to be the conservatives, or was, were the liberals going to take over? And you're aware, I'm not talking about politics, a conservative understanding of the Bible versus a liberal understanding of the Bible. Now, you could say there's a sense in which the liberals won. They, they won that fight and took control of Princeton. So what happened then is most of the conservative professors left and started this seminary, Westminster. And they started it in 1929. Francis then started his studies at Westminster in 1935, so just six years after the conservative professors left Princeton and started Westminster. He studied apologetics under Cornelius Van Til, fairly famous name uh, when it comes to Christian apologetics. He's very well known for his presuppositional approach. But it was interesting, uh, I got to actually hold in my hand Francis Schaeffer's seminary notes when he took apologetics under Van Til in the, in the 1930s, these handwritten notes from almost 100 years ago. I got a chance to hold those in my hand. And it was, it's interesting, you can see how on the main part of the paper, he's probably like you might be doing now or when Tim is teaching, you're taking notes and writing down in your notes what Tim is saying. But then off to the side, maybe you can start doing this too. <laughs> off to the side, Schaefer would write 
his thoughts of what Van Til was saying. So we have this record here of what Van Til was saying in class and then what Schaefer was thinking in response to what Van Til was saying. And you can see right from the very beginning, he had some major disagreements with what Van Til was teaching. Now what happened at Westminster, and unfortunately this, this happens quite often in ministry, is these conservatives then, who had left Princeton to start Westminster, those conservative professors started fighting with each other over what we might say are more secondary issues. And so there was a lot of conflict and a lot of fights among the conservatives at Westminster during, during that first 10 years in the 30s. And eventually what happened is some of those professors left Westminster and started at their own seminary uh, called Faith Theological Seminary in 1937. And Schaefer was a part of that and he actually then transferred to this new seminary and was one of their first graduates in 1938. So remember that, I know that's a lot of names and a lot of different schools, Prince, Princeton, Westminster, and then Faith, but you can kind of see the trajectory of this, first, this battle over the Bible, and then the conservatives battling among themselves, and Schaefer all being a part of that in the 1930s, okay? Well, after seminary, he became a pastor. I love seeing these early pictures of him before he had all of his facial hair and stuff. It doesn't even look like him to me. But this is what he looked like when he was served as a pastor, all clean cut, wearing a tie, which is very unshaferistic, as you know from later in his life. But he was a pastor for 10 years here in America, served in the Presbyterian denomination, one of the conservative um, parts of Presbyterianism. Started first as an associate pastor in Pennsylvania and then became a senior pastor in St. Louis. So he actually served here in the Midwest for a while. They had four children, three daughters, and then a son, Priscilla, Susan, Deborah, and Frank. But after they served here in America for 10 years, they became missionaries to Europe after World War II. So in 1948, they moved to Europe because they wanted to be a part. You can imagine after World War II, Europe was just in shambles, uh, not only physically, you know, a lot of the buildings and streets and roads had been demolished, but also just psychologically and mentally um, there was so much death and carnage, Europe was, was in shambles. And so they wanted to go there and be part of the rebuilding, so to speak, rebuilding uh, Europe, and be there especially as missionaries for Christ and proclaiming God's truth. Now their primary ministry when they moved to Europe was child evangelism. So they would focus on serving children and loving children and evangelizing children, sharing God's truth with children, both within churches and schools, uh, families. What they would do is they would develop material and then go to various churches to serve those churches by helping the churches minister to their own children and then children in the community in the vicinity of that particular church. So that was their primary ministry at first. They ended up in Switzerland in a place called, it, it's not pronounced how it's said, it's called Waymo, right? H-U-E-M-O-Z, but it's pronounced Waymo. And it was on the side of a mountain in the Alps, okay? So a great place to be missionaries, right? I kind of think of it because it's, it's very, it makes me chuckle because it's right next to a, a ski resort, and I love skiing. So how convenient it would be to become a missionary next to a ski resort, right? It's kind of like being called to be a missionary in Hawaii or something. It's like, oh, that's going to be pretty rough living there on the beach, <laughs> serving Christ. But for whatever reason, they ended up in Switzerland on the side of a mountain. Now what happened, though, shortly after they moved to Europe, 
and this is really important, and this is probably something that you haven't heard yet as you've been studying Schaefer, is that he went through a tremendous crisis of faith in the early 1950s. Now, if you think about this, if he was born in 1912, this would be, what, he'd almost be 40 years old. He had been a pastor for 10 years, right? So you would think, how could somebody at that age of life and somebody who had had that much theological seminary training and had been a shepherd, a pastor of other people, for 10 years, how could someone like that go through a crisis of faith? Well, what really instigated in his mind this crisis of faith was all of the fighting that he had seen uh, among Christians. Remember, he was a part of all of that fighting, uh, first over Princeton and then among the conservative folks at Westminster. They were fighting over secondary issues and then some of them left and started faith. And he had been part of that mix. And so he was really struggling with how could Christianity be true when there's so much hate and anger among us Christians and infighting. A lot of times, you know, disagreements among Christians might start for good reasons, right? There might be theological issues that we need to do battle over, right? Or there might be ministry decisions that are right or wrong within a church or a ministry that need to be fought over. But it can oftentimes and very easily develop into personality conflicts and struggles for power. And you, and you might have good intentions at first, too, thinking, well, I need to be in power. I need to have this sort of position or power so I can make sure the right things get done. But then Satan is so good about whispering in our ears and causing us to have pride and arrogance, and we end up fighting for the power more than maybe the good intentions we had at the beginning. And Schaefer had seen all this, and he wasn't seeing it. The crisis of faith that he had wasn't as much that he saw other Christians who were fighting and that troubled him, although it did. What really caused him the most angst was that he saw the hatred and the fighting within himself. And so he wondered, how could Christianity be true? We talk about love. We talk about God loving us and forgiving us, and therefore we're to forgive others and love others. And yet, why do I have so much anger and hatred in my heart? towards those I disagree with. And that's what began his crisis of faith, his doubts, whether Christianity was even true. And this crisis uh, lasted, there's a sense in which it lasted almost two years, where he had to, in his own words, go back to the beginning and really think through to himself if Christianity was even really true or not. And this was very... Uh, troubling for his wife, as you can imagine, because she was a strong Christian. And he would share with her, look, um, you're just going to have to be patient with me as I think through this st stuff because I'm really struggling. Mm -hmm. And he went on a lot of walks by himself, and I'm sure there was a lot of prayer and thinking. But he, he came through that crisis of faith with a stronger faith than he had before. And through that process, I think it's really that crisis of faith and the experiences he had gone through with uh, fighting Christians and being a part of that fight, which then gave birth to this beautiful ministry of Labrie, which I'll explain now how that came about. Because it was shortly after this crisis of faith in 1950, 1951, that Labrie was born. And one of the... One of the hallmarks of Labrie, as I've been saying, is that they wanted to teach and defend God's truth, but in a loving, respectful way. So here's kind of the logistics of how Labrie was born then. So a few, a few years later, their oldest daughter, Priscilla, went to university. Okay? 
And when she would come home from university, she would bring some friends, uh, maybe who she knew were struggling or having doubts or who weren't Christians, and she knew that her, her parents were really good at talking to people about these issues, right? So she would bring her friends home from university, and Frances and Edith would talk to her friends, and they would give her friends an opportunity to ask all these questions. And Frances was just really gifted in that either one-on-one -on -one interpersonal communication or small group setting. And he would help so many of Priscilla's friends as she would bring them home from university that that's really how Labrie began, is just Priscilla bringing her friends home from university and then them talking and asking questions of both Frances and Edith together. It became such a popular thing and more and more people would come, more friends from university, word kind of got around and it wasn't an official ministry, it didn't have a name or anything. It was just kind of an informal thing, word of mouth. And more people would hear about it, more young people would hear about it. And it became kind of this, you know, at the time, this guru up on the mountain, right? That's not how Schaefer presented himself, but that's how word spread is like, yeah, there's this man who lives up on the mountain and he can answer all your questions. And so people just started flocking up to their chalet up on the side of the mountain. Plus it was a very beautiful place to go. I'm sure that didn't help. I'm sure that didn't hurt at all. It became quickly then a place where young people could go and wrestle with their questions in a, oh, what do you want to say? Safe environment, a safe atmosphere where maybe they were afraid to discuss these things with their family or within their church for fear of maybe being judged or looked down upon, they could go to this place where Francis and Edith lived and stay with them maybe for a few days, maybe for a few weeks, and really wrestle um, out loud with their issues and share what they were going through without being uh, judged or um, scolded for what they were struggling with. Well, in June of 1955, then, they officially launched, launched this ministry as an independent ministry, so they kind of broke away from their missionary organization that they were part of, and went out on their own and la launched this ministry called Labrie. And it became a, a growing community. As more and more people would, would just flock to the side of the mountain, they had to buy additional buildings. Some people would stay with them for a couple days, some for a few weeks some for a few months. I went, when I went to uh, the Libri in Switzerland, I met a man who had been there for, since it began in 1955. So this would have been 2016, help me do the math, 40 ply, 45 plus 15. So for 60 years, this, at the time, a young person at university in 1955 went there and had been there then for 60 years. Now that's unique, I, that doesn't happen very often, obviously. A lot of people would stay for a few weeks, a few months, some of them for a couple of years, and then they would develop this community there. It was a place where they could uh, live and work together, study together, and they developed a very uh, beautiful, loving community. They had structure to it, so if you would be um, a student, let's say, if you were gonna stay at Labrie, and this is even how it works today, if you're going to stay at Labrie, let's say for two weeks or for two months or for two years, then the way that their lives are structured there is you work half the day to help take care of the community, whether you're cleaning or cooking or building things, you work half the day, and then the other half of the day you study, usually independent study. Somebody will guide you, but you're spending half of the day just studying on your own maybe listening to tapes, uh, reading books. So that's how they structured the community at Labrie. Half the day working, half the day studying. And then in the evenings, there would always be a lot of lectures and discussion groups, okay? And that's really where Francis, that was his sweet spot, was in those discussion groups, where he'd gather you know, 10, 12, 15 people, and they would just pepper him with questions. And he was very insightful and a good thinker on his feet and could help them where they were at. So in terms of, he would also lecture, 
But that's really where his sweet spot was at, was in that interaction, that group interaction. Now let me talk a little bit about what was going on in the uh, culture of the day. Okay, So we're talking the 1950s, moving into the 1960s now, and what's going on in Western culture. It was a very unique time in Europe. There was a philosophy, very popular at the time, called existentialism. And what, what existentialism was causing around the world, uh, there's a lot of things I disagree with about existentialism, but one thing that was good that came out of that philosophical movement is that it caused people to search for meaning and truth, okay? It really lit a fire under people, so to speak, to go out and try to find what was the meaning in life. So let me just give you a, a brief summary of what was going on in the thinking of the culture at the time, right? Well, what we have, by the time we get to the middle of the 20th century, what we have now is, oh, 200 years of enlightenment thinking, 200 years of really science becoming the king, so to speak, in terms of human knowledge, right? And science, according to science, science tells us that we're merely biological machines, okay? And love is just a chemical reaction. We're just accidents of a haphazard process, which we call evolution. You know, we're cobbled together through these accidents and natural selection. And love was just picked up along the way, what we call love, is really just a chemical reaction that nature selected for because it led to, as you can imagine, uh, greater chances of reproduction and survival. So love isn't real. There's no meaning there. It's just an accident of our evolutionary programming. This is what science is, is telling us, right? That life has no meaning. Love has no meaning. The thing is, though, nobody can live out those ideas consistently, right? It's, it's almost as though we can't help but to value human life. We can't help but to believe that love is real. Yeah, we can say, I know science tells us that I'm just a machine, that there's no meaning or purpose in life, that love is just a chemical reaction, but nobody can live that out consistently. So Schaefer would say often things like, even the scientist, when the scientist leaves his lab and goes home, he tells his family that he loves them. He tells his wife and children that he loves them. So in the lab, he puts on his science coat, right? His white coat and his science paraphernalia and says, yeah, I know love isn't real. I know we're just biological machines, just accidents. There's no meaning to life. You know, it's, life is meaningless. Love isn't real. It's just a chemical reaction. But yet he can't live that out consistently. He goes home and tells his family, his wife and his children, that he loves them. So there's this inconsistency in our thinking. There's, there's this tension there. We, on one hand, we believe we're just machines, that life has no meaning, that love is just a chemical reaction. But on the same time, we just can't help but to believe uh, in love and to live out uh, the thinking that love is real. And so the only way that people could really hold on to that tension was a leap of faith. To believe that love was real, um, in, in, in light of what science tells us, if we were going to believe that love is real, you would have to take an irrational leap of faith and just believe in it. Uh, you don't have any reasons or evidence to believe that love is real, but you just believe it because maybe you want to. Or you just have a subjective uh, feeling that you want to believe in love. You like it, let's say. And so there's, there's this tension in the thinking of our culture, this irrational leap of faith just to believe that love is true, a subjective truth, if you will, a subjective relative truth that love is real. I'm just going to believe it anyway, even though I don't have any reasons or evidence to believe it. I'm just going to take an irrational leap of faith and believe that love is real. 
And what Schaefer was really good at was pointing out these contradictions or these inconsistencies in people's thinking. So he would help them realize that they're actually living a lie, if you will. They're living, um, their thinking has contradictions in it. Their thinking is muddled and messed up. And that tension there is what Schaefer could point people to to help them see. And he'd often, he'd often start there. And this would be a way then he could argue for the truth of Christianity because he would do something like this. He would say, look, we, we know that love is real, okay? Um, it just seems to be something that is undeniable, that life has meaning and love is real. It's not a chemical reaction. It's, it's something that's real and tangible. And then he would say, you know, what is the best, ex if we know that love is real, what is the best explanation of how and why love is real. And then he would compare, for example, um, secular humanism or atheistic materialism. You know, does that have a good explanation of how and why love is real? And he would point out and show, no, it actually doesn't. There's secular humanism or atheistic materialism, whatever you want to call it, doesn't have a good explanation for how love could be real. However, Christianity does. Christianity has a very good, rational, reasonable explanation for how love can be real. And then he would show that um, Christianity is a, has a better, more reasonable explanation to explain what we know, that love is real. And he would often begin with the love within the Trinity. That God, uh, even before he created any of us, there was love that existed between the members of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then when God created us, he created us in his image um, to be a part of that, those loving relationships. So he created us to what? As Jesus said, the greatest commandments are to love God and to love others, right? So love has its ultimate source within God. And then he created us in his image to be uh, lovers, to love God and love others. And so Christianity then provides really the best explanation for how love can be real because we are created by a loving God. So you can believe in love without taking an irrational, blind leap of faith. No, you can actually believe in love based on good reasons and evidence. Now another thing that was going on at the culture of the time, besides existentialism, was a, a counter-cultural movement, okay? So let me explain a little bit what was going on. And this is, this is connected with existentialism, uh, but a little bit different. So I wanted to kind of break them apart and explain to you both of these movements. So we've got existentialism that's taking place in philosophy especially in Europe, but then also in the 1950s, there's this countercultural movement going on. What was that? Well, in the 1950s, a lot of young people in Europe were really just disgusted with the normal, middle-class lifestyle, okay? As you know, after World War II in the 1940s and 1950s, there was a lot of um, prosperity after the war. You know, we picked up the pieces very quickly and there was a lot of prosperity. And this is kind of the birth of the middle class, right? You think of all the 1950s, especially here in America, what we're used to is all these um, suburbs being built and all these cookie cutter homes and everybody could have their own home and their own car. And there was a lot of material wealth in the 1950s. But a lot of young people were kind of turned off by that um, materialistic way of living. So a lot of young people in Europe in the 1950s, they, they looked at what was going on and they saw people as they saw it, working boring nine to five jobs, just accumulating material possessions, maybe being stuck in an unhappy marriage that looked meaningless. And they said, we don't want that. We don't want that plastic life. 
Um, that just seems meaningless. It just seems like we're cogs in a machine, the suburbanites, this boring way of life. And so they rejected against the culture, so to speak. And they began this countercultural movement. Sometimes they're called uh, the beatniks of the 50s. Maybe you've heard that term before, the beatniks. And they searched for meaning. They didn't think there was any meaning in a life where you just went to a boring job nine to five and went home in your suburb and you know, drank your coffee and had a meaningless, unhappy marriage. So they, they didn't see meaning there, purpose and that type of life. And so they searched for meaning in all sorts of other things. Um, they looked for meaning in sex, drugs, uh, music, Eastern religion, different alternative lifestyles, like living in a commune. So they were looking for meaning and purpose in different ways. And a lot of these young people in the 1950s in Europe would find their way to Labri. Because remember, both with existentialism and then with this countercultural movement, a lot of young people were looking for meaning in life. You know, what is the purpose? What am I here for? Maybe you wrestle with that sometimes yourself. And so a lot of these uh, young people would make the trek up the mountain, so to speak, and find themselves at Labri asking these questions. What is the purpose of life? What is, what is the meaning of existence? And Schaefer was very kind, whereas a lot of Christians in Europe in the 1950s um, were harsh towards these beatniks, right? And looked down upon them. And certainly they were doing some terrible things, right? With um, illicit sex and drugs and making horrendous mistakes, pursuing, you know, Eastern religions and stuff. There was a lot to be judgmental of. But Schaefer was more, oh, I guess you could say, patient with them and kind and loving with them as they would come to Labri. He would sympathize with them because here's, here's a way they could sympathize with them, uh, that Schaefer sympathized with them. He would say, look, I, I think you're right. I think that sort of plastic life that you're describing, the working the nine to five, the just going about your life, never really doing anything, just living a bore, accumulating material possessions, getting that car you always wanted, then finally getting that boat and maybe that vacation house. Yeah, that sort of existence is meaningless. I think you're right young people, right? So he could sympathize with their frustrations about middle-class life, but then he would point them in the right direction. He would disagree with them about where they were trying to find meaning, whether it was in sex or drugs, right, Eastern religions, and he would point them ultimately to Christ and God for ultimate meaning. And this was a messy process, all right? This wasn't, this wasn't just showing up right on a Friday morning at a church and teaching you, know, you all for an hour or so. This was opening up your home to drug addicts. This was having young people come and stay with you who smelled bad and were addicted to drugs. And they would bring drugs into their home. And they would be you know, throwing up and sick, and they were helping people overcome their drug addiction. And this was a very, and not everybody would get born again the next day, right? Sometimes people would be there for months or years before they turned to faith in Christ, if ever, right? A lot of people would leave Labri still not being a Christian. But they were very welcoming and kind and non judgmental as these people would come and live with them. And they would try to take care of not only their spiritual needs, but their physical needs as well. It was a very, very messy process. As you're probably aware, this movement, this countercultural movement in the 1950s in Europe, eventually moved across the pond and came to America, right? And so we're familiar with the movement more in the 1960s in America. Now, the most famous part of this countercultural movement were the hippies, right? So we've got a lot of jokes and songs about uh, our hippies. Uh, we, they call them beatniks in Europe, but for whatever reason, we call them hippies here in America. But it was that same, almost exact same thought process of looking for meaning, 
rejecting the middle class, boring culture. They didn't see that there was any meaning there. And so they were searching for meaning, a lot of them in drugs and LSD and other things. Now, when this movement then hit America in the 1960s, uh, hippies and, and other countercultural movements, a lot of the, the Christians didn't know what was going on. They didn't understand it. Um, it was very confusing to them. It just, it, to them, it seemed like it came out of nowhere. Why are all these young people growing you know, their facial hair and their hair long and taking drugs and not wanting to, to work but go live in communes and stuff? What's going on? And you can imagine you know, the parents and the, the older generation just not understanding, and even the Christian leaders and the pastors just not really understanding what these young people were struggling with. But you see, Schaefer had been working with young people struggling with these things, working with these ideas for 10 years already, all throughout the 50s in Europe. And so uh, when this movement began in America and just you know, took America by storm, uh, Schaefer understood it because he had been working with it for 10 years already. And so he saw from a distance you know, that the American Christian leaders were really struggling and not understanding the movement or knowing how to uh, serve and love these people and reach them for Christ, he then would often come to America throughout the 60s and speak and help Christian leaders in America to understand this movement and understand it so they could help people in the movement and point them to Christ. So he would come to America to speak at churches and Bible colleges and seminaries. So all throughout the 60s, Schaefer's, um, Francis and Edith were coming to America to speak quite often. And one of the big things that he did was to help people understand the, the philosophical roots of these movements both existentialism and this countercultural movement. And he explained, as you guys are studying, that it, it didn't just come out of the blue. There's a whole history of thinking, a whole history of thought from which these ideas eventually came from. And he helped people to understand and see that. Now, one of the most famous lecture series that he did was at uh, Wheaton College in 1965, okay? What happened at Wheaton was that Schaefer was invited in to give a week-long series of lectures, okay? So he came to Wheaton College, and I think it was, yeah, two lectures a day for an entire week. So we're talking 10 lectures total. And it was that week in 1965 that he gave these, really, what came to be famous, momentous lectures of his ministry there at Wheaton College in 1965. What happened was he gave these lectures and somebody made a transcript of them. You know what a transcript is, right? It'd be like if I'm teaching now and somebody took the, the video of it later and just wrote down everything I said word for word. Somebody did that, I guess at the time, just penciling you know, everything that Schaefer was saying and they made a transcript of all 10 lectures and started passing it around. You know, at first, I, I would guess it was probably just for themselves because they were enthralled with what he was saying. But then the students, even after the week was over with and Schaefer left, more and more students wanted a copy uh, of that transcript. And so they would make copies and make copies and they just kept running out because everybody wanted a copy of that transcript. And I actually have a, a copy uh, for you guys to look at. Now, this is very, very difficult to come by. I had a very hard time getting my hands on one of these transcripts. So be careful with it, all right? And I want this back. Um, and this isn't from 1965. I think this was printed probably 10 years ago. But this is uh, a transcript of exactly what he said during those lectures. So what happened then uh, with that transcript, somebody realized along the way, hey, uh, what we really have here is a book. We, we have a book. These 10 lectures really should be published as a book. And that's exactly what happened. So they found a publisher and published then uh, his first book, 
which came to be known as The God Who Is There. This was Francis Schaeffer's first book, and it was developed from these lectures he gave in 1965. He went on to write uh, 20 more books, I think 22 total, and this is the easiest way to own them all, because it can be kind of hard if you want to collect you know, all of his 22 books that he wrote. But eventually, they put them all in this set, which you can buy. I think Crossway sells it. So in five volumes, you can have all of his books in one collection there. So that's a great way to have it. And it's not very expensive. You can have all 22 of his books. One of the most well-known, besides his first one, The God Who Is There, is the one that you guys are studying through, How Should We Then Live? And I don't know if you guys are using this version. We have an updated version. Yeah, this is the original version back from the 70s. So this is kind of neat because it's, I mean, it's hardback, first of all. But it also has uh, pictures in it as well, which the, the new paperback version doesn't. So this is kind of neat. I'll send this around. This is one of the, from the first edition. Another neat thing that developed out of the Schaefer out of Labrie was a tape ministry. So throughout the 60s and 70s, Schaefer would teach lectures at Labrie, usually in uh, the chapel there, right? And they would tape them back on these old ancient things called tape recorders, right? <laughs> they would tape his lectures and what began then was a, a tape ministry. As people around the world requested, who maybe couldn't make it to Labrie, they would request some of his lectures on tape. And so this tape ministry began in the basement of the chapel where they had hundreds and hundreds of the lectures on tape and they would send them around through the mail to people all around the world. But now, most all of these lectures have been digitalized and can be listened to, downloaded for free at that website. So it's libriideaslibrary.org. So you can go there, and I, I've done it. I've listened to probably hundreds, if not over a thousand lectures from Schaefer um, from the 60s and 70s at that website. I'm going to speed up a little bit here, kind of go through the, the history and what happened. They developed uh, other Libri ministries throughout the world. So they stayed in Switzerland for the most part. But other people with their leadership, right, Francis and Edith's leadership, other people started other Libris, and they functioned very similar, similarly to theirs in Switzerland. But they developed Libris in uh, England, two in the United States, one in Minnesota, one in Massachusetts, the Netherlands, Canada, and South Korea now today. So we have Libris all around the world. In the 1970s, um, they developed a video ministry. So two main series. The first one, How Should We Then Live, which you guys are watching. And then the second one, which mostly has to do with abortion, was called Whatever Happened to the Human Race. Now this is an interesting transition that kind of happened later in his ministry. So now we're talking mid to late 70s, early 80s. And Schaefer himself moved into, I guess what you could call political activism. He got involved in politics, if you will. Now, he never ran for office, right? He never tried to become a governor, or a, a congressperson or something, right? But he started advocating uh, in the political realm, usually for moral issues, okay? And the primary one is uh, abortion. He fought against abortion. Now, some Christians heavily criticized him for this. They thought he was switching gears. They thought he was you know, leaving the gospel behind and, and getting in too much involved in the government. But the way that Schaefer saw it um, is that you know, different people are called to different things. Not everybody is called to you know, work with or in the government, but some people are. Maybe God is calling you to work in that field, either as a politician or in the political realm. But he doesn't call all Christians to work in that realm. Other Christians he calls to be plumbers or lawyers. Some Christians he calls to be pastors. But what Schaefer was really passionate about was that he wanted to see governments flourish 
in their God-given ministry of promoting good and punishing evil. So he had a very, very biblical understanding of government from Romans 13, that government is a minister of God to promote good and to punish evil. And he wanted to see God's minister, the government, do well in its role. And so that was his motivation or justification in getting involved, especially in the abortion issue. Now, a little bit of his legacy. He passed away in 1984 from a form of, of cancer, relatively young age, so 72 approximately, he, he passed away. But his books, his lectures, his films continue to help people today. Really, uh, at an intellectual level, if you will, um, help people understand where philosophical ideas come from and how they're not as um, sufficient in giving the answers to life as Christianity is, but also he's helpful in providing this example of how to love people as you're proclaiming God's truth. And I love him for that. Now his wife Edith uh, went on to live much longer than he did. He passed away in 1984. She almost lived 30 more years after Francis did. She passed away at the age of 98. She almost made it to 100. In 2013, so not even 10 years ago, Edith passed away. And she was a, a, an author herself. In fact, a lot of people would say she was probably a better writer, a more clearer communicator. And if you get a chance to read some of her books, you'll see you know, she doesn't deal maybe with the intellectual, philosophical ideas as much, but just her, her prose and her, her writing. You know, she's a very, very good writer, and she wrote 20-plus books, one of them being their autobiography. So this is something that I would encourage you to read, too, if you're interested to know more right from themselves, their history and how things developed and the ministry and how they did it. It's just a book called uh, Labrie that Edith wrote. So this is something I would recommend. I'll pass this around. And this one's special uh, because you can see at the beginning it was actually signed by Edith. She didn't sign it for me. <laughs> uh, she signed it for somebody else, but I, I got a chance to pick up the book eventually. So I like it. It's special to me because it has her signature in it. Okay, we've got about 10 minutes left. Is that right? Okay. So what I want to do for the rest of the time is just tell you a little bit about how Schaefer uh, influenced me in my life. So I went through a similar crisis of faith when I was in my mid to late 20s. I was a Christian, but I was really wrestling with my faith. Is Christianity really true? And I'm so thankful that um, there was a pastor that I was talking with who was very kind and loving to me and patient with me, and he gave me um, this book by Francis Schaeffer. I had never heard of Schaeffer before at this time. I was in my mid to late 20s, and he gave me this book. It's called The Trilogy, and it's just his first three books together in one volume. He gave me this book, and that was my introduction to Schaeffer. And I really, I gobbled it up and then got more and more of his books. And he really helped me to understand. The main thing I think he helped me with is just the relationship between faith and reason and, and why our faith should be based on good reasons and evidence. Because that was a big issue that I was struggling with in my crisis of faith. Well, through that process, it became clear to me that God was calling me to serve other people the way that Schaefer had served me through his books. And so that began a process in my life of, of moving away. I was working in the field of actuarial science at the time, but it began a, a slow process of moving away from that into full-time ministry. So I went to seminary on the East Coast, served as a, a local church pastor there for eight years, and then got a chance to work on a, a PhD in philosophy took me seven years, and so I was at seminary for my, to be a pastor, Master of Divinity, for six years, and then my PhD took me seven years because I had to do it part-time with the family and working full-time. But one thing that was really exciting for me when I was at my seminary, I went to Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. One really exciting thing for me there was 
uh, the Schaefer family had approached my seminary with um, all of Francis and Edith's personal files. Okay? Now, they were really good about keeping records, and Francis and Edith both had a very vibrant ministry of writing letters to people. Okay? They would write letters. People would write them who maybe couldn't come to Labrie. They would write letters to Francis and Edith, and then Francis and Edith would write them back. And they kept a copy of all of these letters. And so the family, the Schaefer family, approached my seminary, and they said, look, we've got a hundred file boxes all full of their personal letters, their uh, notes, as I said, Francis's seminary notes that he took from the 1930s were in these boxes, old video and audio tapes that nobody had ever heard before from Labrie going back to the, the 1950s, the early days of Labrie, a bunch of annotated articles where Schaefer would read magazines or books and he would make notes off to the side. Those were in these files. And the family didn't have the resources to archive, because this is a treasure, right, of information. But they entered into a custodial agreement with my seminary, and this collection, it's called the Francis Schaeffer Collection, is at my seminary in North Carolina in the archives department. Now, it's not available to the public. Not anybody can just walk in there and go through these letters, because there's a lot of private information in there, as you can imagine. But if you get approval from the family, the Schaeffer family, uh, you can, uh, professional researchers can go in and, and research some of this stuff. And I got a chance to do that, part of my PhD research. I spent hundreds and hundreds of hours just digging through this Schaefer collection and their private personal letters. And it, to me, it was fascinating because it gave me a behind the scenes look. Because can, anybody can read his books and learn about him on the internet, but to read these uh, private personal letters as they would write back and forth was incredible. And it, to me, it gave me a really behind-the-scenes look into how they thought and functioned in their ministry. And I found some really cool letters in there. I mean, he, Schaefer, by the time you get to the 70s and 80s, he was writing everybody. I found private letters in there from uh, Schaefer and Ronald Reagan back and forth, Schaefer and George Bush Sr., um, Ronald Reagan and Billy Graham had a lot of letters back and forth, John Stott. Um, political leaders from around the world. There's a lot of neat stuff in there. And so I got a chance to, to dig through that. And out of that research, um, I got a chance to write an academic paper about Schaefer's epistemology. So from my research in this Schaefer collection, even though there's a lot of cool personal stuff in there, uh, what I wanted to write a paper about was some of his philosophical ideas. And so I wrote a paper about comparing his, his philosophical position on how we know things with another famous philosopher named Michael Polanyi. And that paper ended up getting published that I wrote in the Westminster's academic journal. This is an article that I wrote about Schaeffer's philosophy. And from that, um, after that article was published, I got the opportunity to go and present uh, my work at the Labrie in Switzerland and then the Labrie right outside of London. So as we wrap things up, I was going to show you some of the pictures that my wife and I took when we were at Labrie. This would be, oh, seven, six, seven years ago now. So here is my wife and I at the front of the main chalet. Uh, that's what they call the big houses there. This is where Francis and Edith lived when they were in Switzerland. You can see my wife and I down here. Now imagine, I want to show you a picture of what they saw right out their front door, right? This was the scenic mountain that they lived on. So just imagine if I'm the photographer right now, right, and I'm taking a picture of Adam and Kristen, if I as the photographer would turn around and take a picture um, of what's behind me, this is what you would see. It's the Swiss Alps. They're incredible. So that was the view they had every day they looked out their front door. This was their view. Pretty rough, huh? <laughs> and there was, off to the left here, there was the, the big ski resort, which you could see. Uh, very, very beautiful. 
So just a couple more pictures. This is a chance we got to take uh, just hiking up the mountain from the chalet. So this is the chapel that they built. This is where they host their lectures, where Francis did most of his teaching and lecturing from. So this is what really blew me away. I mean, this was like a mecca for me, right? I had spent so many years um, really looking up to Schaefer and studying Schaefer and listening to these lectures. As I said, I've listened to hundreds and hundreds of lectures, him giving lectures from this room right here. And finally, in 2016, I was able to go and uh, to this room myself and give a lecture from the same place that I had listened to him give lectures um, for decades. So here is 2016, what the room looks like now. You can see this is the pipe organ. For some reason, they, they built uh, wooden cabinets around it for some reason. I'm not sure why, but they covered up the beautiful pipe organs. But these are the windows that look out to the mountain or down the side of the mountain. You can see those over here. And they had moved the lectern for some reason. They didn't give lectures this way anymore. The lectern, you can see it, is right over there. So when I got a chance to speak, um, that's me speaking in the, in the chapel. And it was just twisted, I guess, what, 90 degrees. But that was a blast. That, like I said, to me, it was like a, a Mecca experience to go there. So this is the uh, Labrie then, right outside of London. We got a chance to go there a couple years later and present my work. And that was a, a great, that was great fun as well. Now the, the um, obviously it's not on the side of a mountain in London, but it's this huge manson, mansion. It's hard to capture in one picture just how big this building is. It's just massive. Um, but it was donated to the Schaefer's, donated to Labrie, and this is right outside of London where it functions the same way. People come and live a couple days, a couple months, a couple years, work half the day, study half the day, do lectures and so on. But it's just a huge, big, old building. Very beautiful. One of the most exciting things to me, though, uh, when I was there at both places what I, was that I got a chance to meet uh, the Schaefer family. I had met uh, Deborah, the youngest daughter, and her husband, Udo Middleman, when they came to my seminary and donated the Schaefer collection. But there in Europe, then, I got a chance to meet, um, that's one of Schaefer's, I think, great-granddaughters. So I got a chance to meet her. And then this is uh, Ranald McCauley. He married one of Schaefer's uh, daughters. She couldn't come to church that day because she wasn't feeling well. But he came, so I got a chance to meet him and talk with him. And we corresponded back and forth via email afterwards for quite a while. So that was really exciting uh, to me. The last slide that I have is just to share with you a little bit more about my own work. Because even my primary work, I would say, has been influenced by Schaefer. So through my PhD process, um, I wrote a dissertation that's gonna get published as a book in March. It's coming out. It's called Divine Love Theory. And it has a lot to do with uh, the Trinity. And it's, um, I would say the, maybe the initial seed of my thinking, my initial thought in developing my theory came from some of Schaefer's ideas and explanation about the Trinity. And as I talked before, he would use the Trinity often to explain how we as Christians have a much more reasonable explanation for how love can be real than any other belief system. So if you can compare it with, let's say, atheism, atheism doesn't seem to have a good explanation for how love can be real, right? To them, it just seems like it's just a chemical reaction that happened accidentally through evolution. Um, but we as Christians, we can believe in love without taking an irrational leap of faith. We can believe uh, that love is real, but we have good reasons and evidence to believe it's real based on our belief that God existed even before he created any of us as a trinity of three loving persons. And so this book of mine then, which there's a sense in which I've been writing for the last 10 years, is really just that simple argument um, laid out in, in, a, in a strict analytical philosophical way and then compared with one of the leading atheistic 
uh, explanations of how love and morality can be real. And I try to show that my divine love theory, our Trinitarian understanding of Christianity, is a better explanation for that. So time is up. I want to thank again Tim for inviting me here to speak on these things and to share with you, you know, how Schaefer has influenced my life. And I hope as you guys study through the rest of his material that some of this maybe biographical background and information about their history will help you as you study through his ideas. So thanks very much for having me today. <laughs>